the realm heavens. Yeah, the commentary says that the gods in the six desire sphere heavenly worlds are intended here as Davis. <laughs> okay, next comes, he perceives Pajapati as Pajapati. And this is a little puzzling. Now the commentary, this is where I disagree with the commentary, the commentary, you see the word Pajapati means literally, Paja means creation or the population, and Pati means Lord or Master. So Pajapati is the Lord or Master of creation. And Pajapati is one of the chief deities in the Vedas. And in fact, there's the story about Pajapati as being like the creator god, that Pajapati underwent this great sacrifice. He sacrificed himself, and from the self-sacrifice, the whole creation emerged. And so it seems to me that the Buddha mentions Pajapati just to bring in this important Vedic deity. But you see, the commentary has to relate this to the Buddhist cosmology. And so the commentary says, Pajapati, the lord of the creation, is Mara. <laughs> but I take that with a grain of salt. In fact, I won't even take the grain of salt. I think it's just, um, it's just, the attempt of the commentator to fit everything into a neat scheme of categories. Yeah, the, the early Christian tradition has the same thing with the Gnostics. The Gnostics believed that the creator of the earth was in fact a demiurge of Eden, yeah, yeah. and that, that the god that they worshipped was not involved in the creation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then we have he perceives Brahma as Brahma. Okay, so Brahma was again another deity or the divine creator of Brahmanism. And the Buddha just, you know, mentions him here because this was a common belief in that period. Okay, now we come to some of the deities in the Buddha, the specifically Buddhist cosmology. We have the gods of streaming radiance. These are the called the Abhasara deities. But let's do it this way. Yeah, according to the Buddhist cosmology, this is the fine material realm, or the form realm. Which is divided into four main layers, the first, second, third, and fourth, which are said to correspond to the four jhanas. And then each of these primary realms, of primary layers of the form realm, 
is divided into three secondary layers. Okay, now the Abhasara deities. Well, let's put them here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the, the lowest layer of the form realm is called the Brahma world, and that is the world which is presided over by Mahabrahma. So when the Buddha mentions he perceives Brahma as Brahma, that is referring to the Brahma world. Okay, then we come to the second plane of the form realm, a higher plane and of the three divisions there the highest is the deities or the devas of streaming radiance and so when the Buddha mentions the gods of streaming radiance then he's referring to the second level of the form realm the next come the gods of refulgent glory. These are the Subakina deities. So those are the devas that dwell at the third level of the form realm. And then we come to the next, in section 13, the gods of great fruit. So those are, in Pali, those are the Vehapala Devas. So those are the deities or divine beings dwelling at the fourth level, the fourth layer of the form realm. So this cosmology is a little bit like a concert hall in which there is the <laughs> I don't know the technical terms, the, the sort of the ground level. Tears. Yeah, they're like the tiers, but is there a technical term for the ground level tier? The orchestra. The orchestra. That's called the orchestra level. Okay, and then we have like <laughs> the second layer, it's... Mezzanine. Is that called the mezzanine? Yeah, that's good, I think the mezzanine. And maybe for the special powerful Davis, they have their boxes. You know, if you see the movies about the 19th, 18th century, 19th century concert halls, the aristocrats go to the, they have their boxes. <laughs> I still remember, I think it was the Bela Lugosi <laughs> version of Dracula, where <laughs> Dracula turns up in the box at the concert hall. <laughs> Okay, then there's the third level, that's the balcony, and then the fourth level. Yeah, I was thinking of the word bleaches. It's usually the nodes that are the nodes that are seized, the ones that are highest up, and the nodes that are seized. Nosebleed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, except that there's a re inversion here in that. I think in the concert hall, the lower level is considered the best. And as you go, well, maybe the mezzanine is also classy. But as you go above that, those are the cheap seats. Whereas in the Buddha's cosmology, <laughs> the tickets, the ticket prices increase as one goes up <laughs> the scale of the devas. So in order to get reborn in the Brahma world, one has to master the first jhana. 
but if one aspires for the abhasara world, you have to master the second jhana. To get to the subhakina, you have to master the third jhana. And to get reborn in the vehapala world, one has to master the fourth jhana. And what's interesting here is that the text recognizes that the worldling, you know, we think of a worldling as somebody who might be just going to boxing matches and watching porn on the internet and um, going to the bar, you know, for entertainment on Saturday evening. But a person who masters even these exalted high meditative attainments but lacks the wisdom of the Dhamma is still considered a worldling. So those, the yogis and the ascetics in the Buddha's time and even up to the present, who master these deep meditative absorptions, these deep samadhis, they gain access to these realms. They can perceive them with divine eye, they can, with mystical power, they can travel to those realms, but they still have the subtle manyana, distorted ways of thinking. And so they'll misconceive them and misinterpret them. Okay, so this takes us to the, the, the gods of great fruit. Then next comes something called, in Pali, it's called Abibu, which is translated here as overlord. It's a little bit puzzling to me why that was included. The commentary gives a rather unconvincing explanation. It seems to me my hypothesis would be that the Buddha is just bringing in terms from, that were used in Brahmanism. And so Abhibhu could have been a term that the Brahmins used to designate one of their deities or a group of deities. So I wouldn't lose sleep over trying to interpret this. Okay, next comes, well the next four we take together. So these are the four levels of the formless meditative attainments. The base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, and the, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And so the worldling, the person who's technically still a worldling, can master samadhi to the point of achieving these four formless meditations. And if you remember the story of the Buddha, of his quest for enlightenment, before when he was still a seeker of enlightenment, under his first teacher, he learned the base of nothingness. So his teacher must have been one who attained the base of nothingness, but the Buddha thought that, or he realized after some time, that this practice by itself doesn't lead to enlightenment and liberation. And then under his second meditation teacher, he learned the base of neither perception nor non-perception, and again he left his teacher. So in the Buddha's time, you know, there were the, the yogis, meditation masters who achieve these very, very profound states of meditative absorption. But for the Buddha, they're not the final solution. Okay, next we come to I'll go through all of them and then I'll ask for questions. Okay, next comes a group of four terms that come together. It's a way of classifying all the objects of experience. So here we have, we take them together. The seen, the heard, the sensed, and the cognized. So the seen is visible form. Everything that comes within the range of eye consciousness. The herd is everything that comes within the range of ear consciousness. 
The third term, in Pali, it's muta, and here it's translated the sensed. And so this can be understood as everything that comes within the range of the other three senses, smell, taste, and touch. So all of those objects, odors, flavors, and textures. And then the fourth is the cognized. So this is everything that is known apart from immediate sense experience. Everything which is thought, conceived, imagined, pondered, reflected upon, all ideas, judgments, decisions, volitions, everything else of a non-sensory nature that is known. Okay, next we come to two terms that are sort of contrasted with one another. This is unity or oneness, ekata, and the other is diversity or difference. In Pali, it's ekata versus nanata. And the commentary explains that unity, this refers to the experience in the states of meditative absorption, samadhi, where the mind becomes unified on the object, and just the single simple object becomes present to consciousness. And diversity refers to the totality of non-meditative experience, where there are constantly changing objects continually objects that are diverse, always different. Okay, then in section 25, we come to perceiving all as all. So this is taking everything, all, the whole universe of conditioned phenomena, taking everything together under one category, the all. And probably the Buddha mentions this because, again, this would have been like an important theme in the Upanishads, in that way of, of thinking. It's the basis, could be the basis for what are called the monistic philosophies. The idea that everything is one, of one essence. And the idea that all of that totality of things is identical with myself or myself exists in this totality of things, or myself is something separate from the totality of things. Yeah, if you want to get detailed explanations, again, a plug. <laughs> Order it now, copies, just a few copies left. There's been a sudden rush. Don't forget there are people on the internet who are following this class. They might have placed their orders already. So you find detailed explanation in this book. Okay, so now, now we've gone through 23 bases of conceiving. And now we come to the fourth, uh, I'm sorry, to the 24th, the last one. He perceives Nibbana as Nibbana. And this is where the commentators get a little bit nervous. <laughs> like their sacred cow is being brought under this range of conceiving. And so the commentaries say, I think I have the note here. 
Yeah, the commentary says that Nibbana refers to the five kinds of supreme Nibbana here and now. And this concept of Nibbana here and now, this is explained in the first discourse of the Diga Nikaya. So, the first kind of Nibbana here and now is the thesis that when one fully enjoys the five types of sense objects, beautiful forms, sounds, odors, tastes, textures, that is Nibbana here and now. You know, there were some, apparently there were some philosophers in the Buddha's time who had that position, that the way to Nibbana is taken as you know, the ultimate bliss, the ultimate freedom, so the ultimate bliss, freedom, and happiness is to fully immerse oneself in the enjoyment of the senses. Then there were other philosophers, the, the meditators, who held that the first jhana is the ultimate nibbana. Others said the second jhana, still others the third jhana, still others the fourth jhana. And so we have sensory enjoyment, and the four jhanas, those are the five kinds of nibbana here and now, supreme nibbana here and now. That's what the commentary, that's the way the commentary explains nibbana here. But I think I'm suspicious that the commentary, commentary is a little bit nervous about the Buddha's mentioning nibbana here. <laughs> I think it's probably misconceptions that an person who doesn't have deep insight into the Dhamma will form about the Buddha's idea of Nibbana. So, in an un uninstructed worldling, in fact, there were like, you know, books or ideas, articles and essays published when Buddhism first became known in the West. Like some took Nibbana to be the true self, that the Buddha rejected the false, illusory self, but for him, Nibbana was the true self. And others will think, ah, when I achieve Nibbana, then I will exist within Nibbana. Or else they think Nibbana is one thing, I'm something else, I have to achieve Nibbana. Then I can pride myself and now I can go on Facebook and put in my <laughs> put on my Facebook wall, I've attained Nibbana. <laughs> Please, my Facebook friends, click like. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> I've gotten there. Okay, so having perceived Nibbana as Nibbana, he conceives Nibbana perhaps taking himself to be, his true self to be identical with, with Nibbana. He conceives in Nibbana, taking himself to exist in Nibbana. He conceives from Nibbana, again taking himself to be apart from Nibbana with the idea, I'm here, Nibbana is there, I have to go there and get it. And then when he experiences, maybe he has some mind-shattering experience in meditation, he thinks, ah, I've gotten it. Nibbana is mine. And then he delights in his idea of Nibbana. And why is that? Because he has not fully understood it. Okay, I hope I helped to make this rather cryptic, enig enigmatic passage a little bit clearer. We have some time for questions, if you have questions now. Okay, Michael in the back. It's good if you, if we pass the wireless mic back to him.
Uh, Bonte, earlier, <clears throat> earlier today we spoke of delight associated with craving and um, greed. Yeah. And here we have the, um, here we have delight not associated with craving and greed. So are they to be juxtaposed? Or are we to understand them as two opposing delights? No, the, the delight that's spoken about in this sutta yes. is the delight that's associated with craving. Oh, that's the earlier one. But here we just talked about um, the idea of nirvana, and we said <coughs> that you said that the commentators uh, probably erroneously associated five or four, four or five levels or types of yeah. nirvana here and now, and yeah. the first one I think you mentioned was delight. I said the first, this is the view of... The commentators. So this is the way, that's the way the commentators interpret the expression nibbana here. It's okay. not their position, but they say that the nibbana here refers to the five, the, the theories the five theories of supreme Nibbana here and now, and those five theories, the first was the idea that nib supreme Nibbana is free indulgence and sensual enjoyments, and then the next four are the attainment of the four jhanas. Oh, I see, those would be the Gnostic Buddhas of the times. The what? Gnostic, the Gnostic Buddhas. Anyway, um, it's, a, it's a little, ill-conceived joke. <laughs> yes, um, how is it determined that you've reached this mastered and higher levels of attainment? Is it, is it through your, your teacher? I mean, because this isn't your own, it can't be your own perception. Yeah, of course this question is not so directly relevant to the sutta, but when, well, one might ha have like special experiences in meditation, which one might identify with one of the jhanas, but then to get confirmation, one would have to present it to a qualified teacher to see whether it's really the case. Thank you. Is that Athena? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I need some context. I'm really having trouble figuring out. When you said, you talked about the levels of formless meditation, and you said this is not the final solution. Yeah. That puzzled me. I, what are we solving? Where are we headed? I know this is a, so basic a question, yeah. and I'm okay. sorry for it, okay. but yeah. I don't know where I'm going here. Okay, what I meant when I said this is not the final solution, or the, the Buddha recognized this was not the final solution, because the Buddha was seeking you know, enlightenment and liberation, Nibbana, and apparently his teachers thought they had reached these high formless meditations. They thought, must have thought that this is the supreme attainment, but the Buddha saw that these are still defective states, and so he you know, went off in a different direction. In other words, these states are not where we're really headed. We're headed higher than that. Yeah, um, these are states of deep. Excuse me. These are states of deep concentration. So we have like the f eight levels, the four jhanas. Then beyond the fourth jhana, we have the next four levels of the four formless meditations. The base of infinite space, infinite consciousness nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. And at each level, the mind is becoming quieter, more peaceful, more concentrated, more refined, till when one gets to the base of neither perception nor non-perception, that is the finest and subtlest state of consciousness possible at, in the domain of concentration. But for the Buddha, concentration, deep concentration, was not enough. One has to go beyond by understanding things with wisdom, with insight. 
Uh, so the Buddha brought those states of samadhi into his, the, his system of practice, but he didn't treat them as the final solution. One has to, if one attains them, then one has to step out and then examine things with, with insight. Okay, unless there's, are there any other questions? Anyway, you have lunch time to ponder this. <laughs> and so we'll stop now and we'll do the sharing of the merits. And again, I don't want to be pushy. I don't <laughs> get any, I don't get any royalties. <laughs> I'm not going to get on, I would like to be on the Times bestseller list. <laughs> but if you do want a ex detailed explanation of the sutta with 25, wow, 25 page introduction. I won't tell you who the author of the introduction is. And then you have the translation of the sutta. <coughs> and, then <coughs> and, <coughs> and then you have the commentary explanation of the sutta with extracts, a very special deal. <laughs> extracts from the tika, the sub-commentary, which is very, the sub-commentary is very, very insightful. The author of the sub-commentary seems to have been a very subtle and profound thinker. <coughs> okay, and then if you are <coughs> experiencing aches and pains in your joints, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> pull it, pull it, pull it. <laughs> okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. So you have the verse, the sheet was distributed? No? Oh, I see it was put here to be distributed. Do you? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was distributed. I assume everybody got this sheet with the sort of, which shows the layout of the structure, the schematic representation of the sutta. Anybody didn't get this sheet? Anybody who came in late? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should mention, I announced last week, or a few days ago, that I wouldn't have the class next week, because I thought I would be going away, but it seems that this won't work out. Should we have the class next week? You want to have it next week? Okay, so we'll have it next week. I'll just have to send out early an announcement that we will have the class. Okay, so let us do the sharing of the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditpa chirang rakantu sasanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditpa chirang rakantu desanang Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang. E ta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva anumodantu saba sampati siddhya. E ta vatacham hehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe bhuta anumodantu. Sabha sampati siddhya, etavatacham hehi, 
Sampadang punya sampadang, sabe satanu modantu, saba sampati sidya, bhavagu padaya avici heta to, e tanta re satakayu papana, rupi a rupi cha, asanya sanino, dukha pamu chantu, pusantu nibuting. Okay, then you say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, then we end three times with the half bow. Well, we end with three half bows to the Buddha. 